Monsieur de Voltaire by John Watts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. Monsieur de Voltaire by John Watts. Francois Marie Arouet, better known by the name of Voltaire, was born at Chatenay on the twentieth of February, sixteen ninety four. By assuming the name of Voltaire, young Arouet followed the custom at that time generally practiced by the rich citizens and younger sons, who, leaving the family name to the heir, assumed that of a fief or perhaps of a country house. The father of Monsieur de Voltaire was treasurer to the Chamber of Accounts and his mother, Margaret d'Aumar, was of a noble family of Poitou. The fortune which the father enjoyed enabled him to bestow a first-class education upon the young Arouet, who was sent to the Jesuits' college, where the sons of the nobility received their education. While at school, Voltaire began to write poetry and gave signs of a remarkable genius. His tutors, Father Poiret and Jay, from the boldness and independence of his mind, predicted that he would become the apostle of deism in France. This prediction he fulfilled. Voltaire was, says Lord Brougham, through his whole life a sincere believer in the existence and attributes of the deity. He was a firm and decided and an openly declared unbeliever in Christianity, but he was, without any hesitation or any intermission, a theist. His open declaration of disbelief in the inspiration of the Bible and his total rejection of the dogmas of Christianity laid him open to the malignant attacks and misrepresentations of the priesthood and the bigots of Europe, and so strong were they that his life was continually in danger. Lord Brougham, in his Men of Letters of the time of George the Third, says, Voltaire's name is so intimately connected in the minds of all men with infidelity, in the minds of most men with irreligion, and in the minds of all who are not well informed with these qualities alone, that whoever undertakes to write his life and examine his claims to the vast reputation which all the hostile feelings excited by him against himself have never been able to destroy, or even materially to impair has to labor under a great load of prejudice, and can hardly expect by any detail of particulars to obtain for his subject even common justice at the hands of the general reader. Voltaire was born in a corrupt age, and in a capital where it was fashionable to be immoral. When he left college he was introduced by his own godfather to the Abbey de Chateauneuf, and the notorious Ninon de L'Enclos, who at her death left him by will two thousand livres to purchase books. In estimating the character of Voltaire, a due consideration must be had for the period in which he lived, and of the nature of the society amidst which he was reared. He lived twenty years under the reign of Louis the Fourteenth, and during the whole of the reign of the infamous Louis the Fifteenth when kings, courtiers, and priests set the example of the grossest immorality. It was then, as Voltaire said, that to make the smallest fortune it was better to say four words to the mistress of a king than to write a hundred volumes. Voltaire's life from his youth upwards was a stormy one. After he left college, his father, finding him persisting in writing poetry and living at large, forbade him his house. He insisted upon his son binding himself to an attorney, but his restless disposition quite unfitted him for regular employment, and he soon quitted the profession. He early made the acquaintance of the most celebrated men of his time, but his genius, his wit, and his sarcasm soon raised up numerous enemies. At the age of twenty-two he was accused of having written a satire upon Louis the Fourteenth, who was just dead, and was thrown into the Bastille but he was not cast down. It was here that he sketched his poem of the League, corrected his tragedy of Oedipus, and wrote some merry verses on the misfortune of being a prisoner. The regent duke of Orleans, being informed of his innocence, restored him to freedom and granted him a recompense. I thank your royal highness, said Voltaire, for having provided me with food, but I hope you will not hereafter trouble yourself concerning my lodging. Voltaire, with his activity of mind and living to so great an age, must necessarily produce many works. 
They are voluminous, consisting of history, poetry, and philosophy. His dramatic pieces are numerous and many, of which are considered second only to Shakespeare's. Oedipus, Zadig, Ingenue, Zaire, Henriad, Irene, Tancred, Mohammed, Merope, Saul, Alzier, Le Fanatisme, Mariamne, Gaston de Foix, Enfant Podégieux, Boussiel de Orleans, an essay on fire, the elements, history of Charles the Twelfth, lectures on man, letters on England, memoirs, voyage of Sacramentado, micromegas, maid of Orleans, Brutus, Adelaide, death of Caesar, temple of taste, essays on the manners and spirit of nations, an examination of the holy scriptures, and the philosophical dictionary, are works that emanated from the active brain of this wit, poet, satirist and philosopher. In 1722, while at Brussels, Voltaire met Jean-Baptiste Rousseau, whose misfortunes he deplored and whose poetic talents he esteemed. Voltaire read some of his poems to Rousseau, and he in return read to Voltaire his ode addressed to posterity, which Voltaire, it is asserted, told him would never arrive at the place to which it was addressed. The two poets parted irreconcilable foes. In 1725 Voltaire was again shut up in the Bastille, through attempting to revenge an insult inflicted upon him by a courtier. At the end of six months he was released, but ordered to quit Paris. He sought refuge in England in 1726. He was the guest in that country of a Mr. Falconer of Wandsworth, whose hospitality he remembered with affection so long as life lasted. Voltaire was known to most of the wits and freethinkers of that day in England. At this early age he was at war with Christianity. His visit to England, says Lamartine, gave assurance and gravity to his incredulity, for in France he had only known libertines, in England he knew philosophers. He went to visit Congreve, who had the affection to tell him that he, Congreve, valued himself not on his authorship, but as a man of the world, to which Voltaire administered a just rebuke by saying, I should have never come so far to see a gentleman. Voltaire soon acquired an ample fortune, much of which was expended in aiding men of letters and in encouraging such youth as he thought discovered the seeds of genius. The use he made of riches might prevail on envy itself to pardon him of their acquirement. His pen and his purse were ever at the service of the oppressed. Calais, an infirm old man living at Toulouse, was accused of having hung his son to prevent his becoming a Catholic. The Catholic population became inflamed, and the young man was declared to be a martyr. The father was condemned to the torture and the wheel and died protesting his innocence. The family of Calais was ruined and disgraced. Voltaire, assuring himself of the innocence of the old man, determined to obtain justice for the family. To this end he labored incessantly for three years. In all this time he said a smile did not escape him from which he did not reproach himself as for a crime. His efforts were successful. Nor was this the only cause in which he was engaged on the side of the weak and the wronged against the powerful and the persecuting. His whole life, though maligned as an infidel and a scoffer, was one long act of benevolence. On learning a young niece of Corneille languished in a condition unworthy of his name, Voltaire in the most delicate manner invited her to his house and she there received an education suitable to the rank that her birth had marked for her in society. It is the duty of a soldier, he said, to succor the niece of his general. Voltaire lived for a time at the court of Frederick the Great of Prussia, and for many years carried on a correspondence with that monarch. He quarreled with the king and left the court in a passion. An emissary was dispatched to him to request an apology, who said he was to carry back to the king his answer, verbatim. Voltaire told him that the king might go to the devil. On being asked if that was the message he meant to be delivered, yes, he answered, and add to it that I told you that you might go there with him. In his memoirs he has drawn a most amusing picture of his Prussian majesty. He also says priests never entered the palace, and, in a word, Frederick lived without religion, without a council, and without a court.
Wearied with his rambling and unsettled mode of living, Voltaire bought an estate at Fernay, in the Pas des Ex, where he spent the last twenty years of his life. He rebuilt the house, laid out gardens, kept a good table, and had crowds of visitors from all parts of Europe. Removed from whatever could excite momentary or personal passion, he yielded to his zeal for the destruction of prejudice, which was the most powerful and active of all the sensations he felt. This peaceful life, seldom disturbed except by the threats of persecution rather than persecution itself, was adorned by those acts of enlightened and bold benevolence which, while they relieve the suffering of certain individuals, are of any service to the whole human race. He was known to Europe as the Sage of Fernay. After an absence of more than twenty-seven years, he revisited Paris in the beginning of 1778. He had just finished his play of Irene and was anxious to see it performed. His visit was an ovation. He had outlived all his enemies. After having been the object of unrelenting persecution by the priests and corrupt courtiers of France for a period of more than fifty years, he yet lived to see the day when all that was most eminent in station or most distinguished in talents, all that most shone in society or most ruled in court, seemed to bend before him. At this period he, for the first time, saw Benjamin Franklin. They embraced each other in the midst of public acclamations, and it was said to be Solon who embraced Sophocles. Voltaire did not survive his triumph long. His unwearied activity induced him at his great age to commence a dictionary upon a novel plan, which he prevailed upon the French Academy to take up. These labors brought on spitting of blood, followed by sleeplessness, to obviate which he took opium in considerable quantities. Condorcet says that the servant mistook one of the doses which threw him into a state of lethargy from which he never rallied. He lingered for some time, but at length expired on the 30th of May, 1778, in his eighty-fifth year. It was the custom in those days, and prevails to a considerable extent even in our own time, for the religious world to fabricate horrible deathbeds of all free thinkers. Voltaire's last moments were distorted by his enemies after the approved fashion, and notwithstanding the most unqualified denial on the part of Dr. Berard and others who were present at his death, there are many who believe these falsehoods at this moment. Voltaire died in peace, with the exception of the petty annoyances to which he was subjected by the priests. The philosophers, too, who wished that no public stigma should be cast upon him by the refusal of Christian burial, persuaded him to undergo confession and absolution. This, to oblige his friends, he submitted to. But when the cure one day drew him from his lethargy by shouting into his ear, Do you believe the divinity of Jesus Christ? Voltaire exclaimed, In the name of God, sir, speak to me no more of that man, but let me die in peace. This put to flight all doubts of the pious, and the certificate of burial was refused. But the prohibition of the Bishop of Troyes came too late. Voltaire was buried at the monastery of Cellaris in Champagne, of which his nephew was abbot. Afterwards, during the first French Revolution, the body, at the request of the citizens, was removed to Paris and buried in the Pantheon. Lamartine, in his History of the Girardinists, page 149, speaking of the ceremony, says, On the 11th of July the departmental and municipal authorities went in state to the barrier of Charenton to receive the mortal remains of Voltaire, which were placed on the ancient site of the Bastille, like a conqueror on his trophies. His coffin was exposed to public gaze, and a pedestal was formed for it of stones torn from the foundations of this ancient stronghold of tyranny. And thus Voltaire, when dead, triumphed over those stones which had triumphed over and confined him when living. On one of the blocks was the inscription, Receive on this spot, where despotism once fettered thee, the honors decreed to thee by thy country. The coffin of Voltaire was deposited between those of Descartes and Mirabeau, the spot predestined for this intermediary genius between philosophy and policy, between the design and the execution. The aim of Voltaire's life was the destruction of prejudice and the establishment of reason. 
Deists, said W. J. Fox in 1819, have done much for toleration and religious liberty. It may be doubted if there be a country in Europe where that cause has not been advanced by the writings of Voltaire. In the preface and conclusion to the examination of scriptures, Voltaire says, The ambition of domineering over the mind is one of the strongest passions. A theologian, a missionary, or a partisan of any description is always for conquering like a prince, and there are many more sects than there are sovereigns in the world. To whose guidance shall I submit my mind? Must I be a Christian because I happen to be born in London, or in Madrid must I be a Mussulman because I was born in Turkey? As it is myself alone that I ought to consult, the choice of a religion is my greatest interest. One man adores God by Mohammed, another by the Grand Lama, and another by the Pope. Weak and foolish men adore God by your own reason. I have learnt that a French vicar of the name of John Messilier, who died a short time since, prayed on his deathbed that God would forgive him for having taught Christianity. I have seen a vicar in Dorsetshire relinquish a living of two hundred pounds a year, and confess to his parishioners that his conscience would not permit him to preach the shocking absurdities of the Christians. But neither the will nor the testament of John Messelier, or the declaration of this worthy vicar, are what I consider decisive proofs. Uriel Acosta, a Jew, publicly renounced the Old Testament in Amsterdam. However, I pay no more attention to the Jew Acosta than to Parson Messelier. I will read the arguments on both sides of the trial, with careful attention, not suffering the lawyers to tamper with me, but will weigh before God, the reasons of both parties, and decide according to my conscience. I commence my being, my own instructor. I conclude that every sensible man, every honest man, ought to hold Christianity in abhorrence. The great name of theist, which we can never sufficiently revere, is the only name we ought to adopt. The only gospel we should read is the grand book of nature, written with God's own hand, and stamped with his own seal. The only religion we ought to profess is to adore God and act like honest men. It would be as impossible for this simple and eternal religion to produce evil as it would be impossible for Christian fanaticism not to produce it. But what shall we substitute in its place, say you? What? A ferocious animal has sucked the blood of my relatives. I tell you to rid yourself of this beast, and you ask me, what shall you put in its place? Is it you that put this question to me? Then you are a hundred times more odious than the pagan pontiffs who permitted themselves to enjoy tranquillity among their ceremonies and sacrifices, who did not attempt to enslave the mind by dogmas, who never disputed the powers of the magistrates, and who introduced no discord among mankind. You have the face to ask what you must substitute in the place of your fables. As will be seen by his exclamation on his deathbed, Voltaire was no believer in the divinity of Christ. He disbelieved the Bible in toto. The accounts of the doings of the Jewish kings, as represented in the Old Testament, he has unsparingly ridiculed in the drama Saul. The quiet irony of the following will be easily appreciated. Divinity of Jesus the Socinians, who are regarded as blasphemers, do not recognize the divinity of Jesus Christ. They dare to pretend with the philosophers of antiquity, with the Jews, with the Mohammedans, and most other nations, that the idea of a God-man is monstrous, that the distance from God to man is infinite, and that it is impossible for a perishable body to be infinite, immense, or eternal. They have the confidence to quote Eusebius, bishop of Caesarea, in their favor, who in his Ecclesiastical History, Book I, Chapter Nine, declares that it is absurd to imagine the uncreated and unchangeable nature of Almighty God taking the form of a man. They cite the fathers of the Church, Justin and Tertullian, who have said the same thing. Justin in his dialogue with Trifonius, and Tertullian in his discourse against Praxeus. They quote St. Paul, who never calls Jesus Christ God, and who calls him man very often. They carry their audacity so far as to affirm that the Christians passed three entire ages in forming by degrees the apothesis of Jesus, 
and that they only raised this astonishing edifice by the example of the pagans, who had deified mortals. At first, according to them, Jesus was only regarded as a man, inspired by God, and then as a creature more perfect than others. They gave him some time after a place above the angels, as St. Paul tells us. Every day added to his greatness. He in time became an emanation proceeding from God. This was not enough. He was even born before time. At last he was God consubstantial with God. Crelius, Vocalcius, Natalis, Alexander, and Hornbeck have supported all these blasphemies by arguments which astonish the wise and mislead the weak. Above all, Faustus Socinius spread the seeds of this doctrine in Europe, and at the end of the sixteenth century a new species of Christianity was established. There were already more than three hundred. Philosophical Dictionary, Volume I, page 405. Though a firm and consistent believer in the being of God, Voltaire was no bigot. The calm reasoning of the following passage does honor to its author. Faith Divine faith, about which so much has been written, is evidently nothing more than incredulity brought under subjection. For we certainly have no other faculty than the understanding by which we can believe, and the objects of faith are not those of the understanding. We can believe only what appears to be true, and nothing can appear true but in one of the three following ways. By intuition or feeling, as I exist, I see the sun or by an accumulation of probability amounting to certainty, as there is a city called Constantinople, or by positive demonstration, as triangles of the same base and height are equal. Faith, therefore, being nothing at all of this description, can no more be a belief, a persuasion, than it can be yellow or red. It can be nothing but the annihilation of reason a silence of adoration at the contemplation of things absolutely incomprehensible. Thus, speaking philosophically, no person believes the Trinity, no person believes that the same body can be in a thousand places at once, and he who says, I believe these mysteries, will see beyond the possibility of a doubt, if he reflects for a moment on what passes in his mind, that these words mean no more than, I respect thee, mysteries. I submit myself to those who announce them, for they agree with me that my real reason, their own reason, believe them or not. But it is clear if my reason is not persuaded, I am not persuaded, and my reason cannot possibly be two different things. It is an absolute contradiction that I should receive that as true which my understanding rejects as false. Faith, therefore, is nothing but submissive or deferential incredulity. But why should this submission be exercised when my understanding invincibly recoils? The reason we well know is that my understanding has been persuaded that the mysteries of my faith are laid down by God himself. All, then, that I can do as a reasonable being is to be silent and adore. That is what divines call external faith, and this faith neither is nor can be anything more than respect for things incomprehensible in consequence of the reliance I place on those who teach them. If God himself were to say to me, Thought is of an olive color, the square of a certain number is bitter, I should certainly understand nothing at all from these words. I could not adopt them either as true or false, but I will repeat them if he commands me to do it, and I will make others repeat them at the risk of my life. This is faith. It is nothing more than obedience. In order to obtain a foundation, then, for this obedience, it is merely necessary to examine the books which require it. Our understanding, therefore, should investigate the books of the Old and New Testament, just as it would Plutarch or Levy, and if it finds in them incontestable and decisive evidences, evidences obvious to all minds, and such as would be admitted by men of all nations, that God himself is their author then it is our incumbent duty to subject our understanding to the yoke of faith. Ibid, page 474. Prayer. We know of no religion without prayers. Even the Jews had them, although there was no public form of prayer among them before the time when they sang their canticles in their synagogues, which did not take place until a late period. 
the people of all nations, whether actuated by desires or fears, have summoned the assistance of the divinity. Philosophers, however, more respectful to the Supreme Being, and rising more above human weakness, have been habituated to substitute for prayer resignation. This, in fact, is all that appears proper and suitable between creature and creator. But philosophy is not adapted to the great mass of mankind. It soars too highly above the vulgar. It speaks a language they are unable to comprehend. To propose philosophy to them would be just as weak as to propose the study of conic sections to peasants or fishwomen. Among philosophers themselves I know of no one besides Maximus Tyrius who has treated of this subject. The following is the substance of his ideas upon it. The designs of God exist from all eternity. If the object prayed for be conformable to his immutable will, it must be perfectly useless to request of him the very thing which he has determined to do. If he is prayed to for the reverse of what he has determined to do, he is prayed to be weak, fickle, and inconsistent. Such a prayer implies that this is thought to be his character and is nothing better than ridicule or mockery of him. You either request of him what is just and right, in which case he ought to do it, and it will be actually done without any solicitation, which in fact shows distrust of his rectitude, or what you request is unjust, and then you insult him. You are either worthy or unworthy of the favor you implore. If worthy, he knows it better than you do yourself. If unworthy, you commit an additional crime in requesting that which you do not merit. In a word, we offer up prayers to God only because we have made him after our own image. We treat him like a pacha or sultan who is capable of being exasperated and appeased. In short, all nations pray to God. The sage is resigned and obeys him. Let us pray with the people and let us be resigned to him with the sage. We have already spoken of the public prayer of many nations and of those of Jews. That people have had one from time immortal which deserves all our attention from its resemblance to the prayer taught us by Jesus Christ himself. This Jewish prayer is called the Kaddish, and begins with these words, O God, let thy name be magnified and sanctified, make thy kingdom to prevail, let redemption flourish and the Messiah come quickly. As this radish is recited in Chaldi, it has induced the belief that this is as ancient as the captivity, and that it was at that period that the Jews began to hope for a Messiah, a liberator, or redeemer, who they have since prayed for in the Ihi seasons of their calamities. Ibid, Volume I, I, page 350. Voltaire's contempt for the Bible led him to use the language of holy writ in the coarsest of jokes, though Perhaps with such material the jokes could not well be otherwise than coarse. The following letter he addressed to M. Bayon, intendant of Lyon, on account of a poor Jew taken up for uttering contraband goods. This kind of writing obtained for Voltaire the title of scoffer. Blessings on the Old Testament, which gives me this opportunity of telling you that amongst all those who adore the new, there is not one more devoted to your service than myself. A certain descendant of Jacob, a peddler, as all these gentlemen are, whilst he is waiting for the Messiah, waits also for your protection, which at present he has the most need of. Some honest men of the first trade of St. Matthew, who gather together the Jews and Christians at the gates of your city, have seized something in the breeches pocket of an Israelitish page belonging to the poor circumcised, who has the honor to tender you this billet, with all proper submission and humility. I beg leave to join my amen to his at a venture. I but just saw you at Paris as Moses saw the deity, and should be very happy in seeing you face to face, if the word face can any ways be applied to me. Preserve some remembrance of your old eternal humble servant, who loves you with that chaste and tender affection which the religious Solomon had for his three hundred Shuhamites. Voltaire's prodigious wit and sarcasm were so exuberant that he expended them upon all people and all subjects, even himself when occasion admitted of it. 
In one of his letters addressed to the Elector Palatine, September 9, 1761, he gives this excuse for not attending at the court. I should really make an excellent figure amidst the rejoicings of your Electoral Highness. It was only, I think, in the Egypt of antiquity that skeletons were admitted to a place in their festivals. To say the truth, my lord, it is all over with me. I laugh, indeed, sometimes, but am forced to acknowledge that pain is an evil. It is a comfort to me that your highness is well, but I am fitter for an extreme unction than a baptism. May the peace serve for an era to mark the prince's birth, and may his august father preserve his regard for and accept the profound respects of his little Swiss, Voltaire. In politics Voltaire was not very far advanced. He seems to have had no idea of a nation without a king. A monarch who should not commit any very flagrant acts of tyranny was as much as he appeared to desire. He evidently did not foresee the great revolution that was so soon to burst forth in France, but that he mainly contributed by his writings to bring it about, there can be no doubt. His influence upon the men of his time, both in France and Europe, is ably depicted by such writers as Lamartine, Quinet, and Brome. Voltaire's was the one great mind of his day, whose thoughts engrossed the attention of all men. He was great by his learning, his genius, and his benevolence. And this man was the champion of reason, the enemy of superstition, and an infidel. Quinet, in his lectures on the Romish Church, says, I watch for forty years the reign of one man who is in himself the spiritual director, not of his country, but of his age. From the corner of his chamber he governs the kingdom of spirits. Intellects are every day regulated by his. One word written by his hand traverses Europe. Princes love and kings fear him. They think they are not sure of their kingdom if he be not with them. Whole nations on their side adopt without discussion and emulously repeat every syllable that falls from his pen. Who exercises this incredible power, which had been nowhere seen since the Middle Ages? Is he another Gregory the Second? Is he a Pope? No. Voltaire. We conclude our sketch with the eloquent words of Lamartine, who describes in a few sentences the inestimable services rendered to free thought and intellectual progress by the sage of Ferney. If we judge of men by what they have done, then Voltaire is incontestably the greatest writer of modern Europe. No one has caused through the powerful influence of his genius alone, and the perseverance of his will, so great a commotion in the minds of men. His pen aroused a world, and has shaken a far mightier empire than that of Charlemagne, the European empire of a theocracy. His genius was not force, but light. Heaven had destined him not to destroy, but to illuminate, and wherever he trod, light followed him. For reason, which is light, had destined him to be first her poet, then her apostle, and lastly her idol. End of Monsieur de Voltaire by John Watts